Hello and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast. I am your host, Fabrice Nye, and joining me here in the Murrieta Studios is Dr. David Burns. Hi, David. Hi, Fabrice. Dr. David Burns has been a pioneer in the development of cognitive therapy, and he is the creator of the new team therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 20 languages. He is an emeritus adjunct clinical professor of psychiatry at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Now, David, we've, uh, we've kind of given an overview in the last podcast about anxiety, what causes it. So today we're going to talk about uh, the different treatment models. That, yeah, how to treat it. Yeah, how to treat it. But you, you know, we're going to start with the with the models because I know you have different ways to look at treatment for anxiety. Yeah. And so let's let's see what those different models are. Yeah. There's, there, you know, I guess we could say there's five models actually. Right. If we include the biological model of anxiety, sure, yeah. that's where you're treating it with medications yeah. and pills. And we'll we'll certainly have a podcast addressing that uh, that that issue. But the four psychotherapy models are the uh, cognitive model, the exposure model, the motivational model, Mm -hmm. and the hidden emotion model. Yes. And these are completely different models in terms of their theories of what causes anxiety. And by the way, I want to say that this, this list will be in the show notes so people don't have to, you know, remember what those names are. Good, good point. And they they are each associated with radically different uh, different treatment tech, techniques. Yeah. Now um, the 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 cognitive model we've we've talked about. It's the idea that when you're anxious, you're giving yourself false messages about something, like like uh, you know like I'm going to blow it on this podcast. I'm going to screw up totally. Uh, yeah. Distorted thoughts, as we were talking about last time. Yeah. A- a- absolutely. And that the treatment is uh, to, to reveal to the person that, that what they're, they're telling themselves is, is not true. Yeah. And the cognitive model is based on the idea that, that, that there's a necessary and sufficient condition for, for emotional change. And, that's, and, and, the, and the, the necessary condition is that you combat your negative thought with a positive thought that's 100% true. We've talked about this on Yeah, disputed, as Alice would say. You know. Yeah, and, and in addition, the, the positive thought has to completely crush the negative thought. So you stop believing the negative thought. And the very moment you stop believing the negative thought, your anxiety will, will disappear. And we can give a lot of examples of, of that model. But that's, that's the cognitive model, yeah. and Ellis and Beck... Uh, have uh, popularized that and were tremendous pioneers in cognitive therapy. Now, the exposure model is is radically different. <clears throat> the behavioral therapists you, use exposure therapy, and they came along and said, no, you cognitive therapists are not right uh, about the causes and cures for, for anxiety. Uh, avoidance is the cause of all anxiety. And you show me a thousand anxious patients, and I'll show you a thousand individuals who are uh, avoiding the things that they're afraid of. If sure. you're afraid of heights, you're avoiding heights. If you have social anxiety, you, you avoid interacting w- with, with people, um, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And, and the behaviorists say the cure for all anxiety is exposure, uh, uh, confronting the thing that you fear the most and that exposure works 100% of the time, and everything else fails 100% of the time. <laughs> and so you should always treat anxiety. Isn't that anxiety. black and white thinking? <laughs> yeah, that, well, it's, <laughs> it's a powerful so, statement. And people like black and white thinking, and there's uh, often a lot of truth b- b- behind the statement, even if it's somewhat exaggerated. But that, that's their point of view. I, I went to an anxiety disorders seminar years ago at one of the, the conferences, and the world's top behavior therapist was there to give this, this presentation on, mm-hmm. on anxiety. Yeah. He's from England. I'm trying to think of his name. Yeah, you, you may have come to your mind. No, I don't know. Well, anyway, he's some famous yeah. guy from England. And so it was a half-day workshop on the treatment of anxiety, and, and he started out by, by, by saying, um, there's only one treatment for anxiety that works, and that's exposure. 
you should tell your patients to confront the thing that they're the most afraid of, and this always works and everything else always fails. That's the end of the workshop. Are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> and it was interesting. He gave a kind of a, a funny example. He, he said he had a, uh, a patient who uh, had OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and was afraid, you know, if you step on a crack, you'll 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 break, break your mother's back. back. Yeah, right. And he had taken this literally, and so mm-hmm. he was terrified of stepping on any kind of, of crack, uh-huh. and was always, you know, avoiding on the sidewalk or the, 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 this type of thing. <laughs> and, uh, I shouldn't be laughing about it, but it, Th- so, that that man was probably miserable. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure he was miserable with with, with this, and uh, so uh, the, the therapist, this world famous. Uh, fellow uh, told him he was going to bring him to a high school gymnasium on a Saturday and where, you know, they have all these boards with, Mm, you know, cracks between them and that he was going to go out and stomp on these, on these cracks Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. and try to, you know, kill a relative. That's exposure. Yeah, right. (laughs) That's what he was. (laughs) We're going to do the whole family. (laughs) Yeah, that's what he was afraid of. So this fellow is just absolutely terrified and, and, you know, he doesn't want to do it. They push him and you've got to get in there, you know, start stomping on these cracks. So he goes in there, he's dizzy. He can barely walk. He's so anxious and confused and he's st- stomping on these on these boards and then he gets an emergency phone call on his cell phone <laughs> that his, his aunt has just died <laughs> and, and so the therapist said to the audience what would you do if you were the therapist you know no one could think of what they were doing he said well my answer was I said I, I, I told him he says I told him he was doing great now get back on in there and see if you can kill another one <laughs> <laughs> But that's 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 exposure therapy. That, that's exposure, yeah. And right, then right, right. Uh, another uh, model uh, is the the motivational mo- model, and this is you know something I've developed with the help of colleagues, and, and it's been a kind of a huge breakthrough in psychotherapy, including the the treatment of of, of anxiety as well as depression and everything. But the idea is, is that when when pe- people are anxious. Uh, that there's these two intense forms of resistance that that keep them stuck in in the anxiety. Yeah, and that includes people you know listening to the show right now who are struggling with anxiety, and I call them outcome resistance and process resistance. And we've referred to them in an earlier podcast. But in in anxiety, the the outcome uh, re- resistance is is that the the anxious individual subconsciously believes that. Even though this anxiety is incredibly painful, if if I were to be cured, press a magic button and be cured, something terrible would, would happen. Like the anxiety is pre- preventing some awful th- thing from, from happening. And a simple example of that would be uh, uh, a woman who uh, worries constantly about her, her, her children dying or getting in accidents, and then yeah. she subconsciously believes that this worrying actually uh, protects them. That's the mother's love. And if she were to stop worrying, something awful ha- would happen. I had a psychologist with uh, public uh, uh, flying anxiety, uh, phobia of, air- of airplanes, but she had to fly with, 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 her, with her husband. Um, and... Um, she believed, but it was miserable being, being on these flights, and she just worry, worry, worry. Yeah. What, what if the plane crashes? But she confided to me that she secretly believed, and she knew it sounded irrational, but she really believed it that her she anxiety the, the, kept, kept the plane in the air, <laughs> and that if she stopped worrying, the, the plane would fall like a stone, <laughs> type of thing. And you see that with with every form of of, of anxiety. That's called outcome resistance, like the patient wants treatment, but on the other hand, they don't really want a good outcome yeah. because they're afraid of this catastrophe. And then there's process res- resistance, uh, and w- which means the, the patient might or might not want a good outcome, but they don't want to have to pay the price, right. and, which in the case of anxiety, of course, is, is using exposure. I, I don't believe that's a, a sole treatment for anxiety, but it's always got to be a part of the treatment package. Yeah. And of course, no anxious patient is going to you know, very, be very eager to, to use exposure because it's so 
so well, terrifying. That's the very reason why they're anxious. They don't want to, uh, exactly. to do that. Yeah. Exactly. And then there's the, the, the motivational model. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the, hidden, the hidden emotion, emotion model. Yeah. And this is another one that I kind of created, although it's kind of a quasi-psychoanalytic model, you, you, you might say. But it's the idea well, that... Well, you know, your, your motto is uh, tools, not schools of therapy. So. Yeah, exactly. And so we can pull some tools out of the psychoanalytic camp yeah. or some ideas and modernize them. But it's the idea that uh, niceness is the cause of all anxiety in the United States at this time. And I, I don't know, have we gone through this in a previous podcast? I don't or? think so. Oh, okay. Well, well, we've talked about it, but not on the podcast. Oh, okay. Well, the, um, like when I do workshops, I, I, I say now... Uh, what, what, what that means is that people who develop anxiety are kind of genetically or due to upbringing these exceptionally nice people, and that niceness is the actual hidden cause of, of the anxiety. And then I, I, I say to the workshop audiences, now we should never make a claim without research, so let's do some research now, and we could kind of do it for the, for the listeners too. But I say in the workshop, how many of you, you know, have struggled with some form of anxiety? And as I've mentioned uh, on the last podcast, almost every hand goes up. Sure, of course. And um, and then I say, now keep your hands in the air while I ask uh, another uh, question. And uh, I say, now how many of you consider yourselves to be basically nice people? And all the hands stay up. Yeah. And I see that's in my point. There's a 1.0, 100% correlation between niceness and anxiety disorders. And, and what that means from a practical point of view is that those of us who are prone to anxiety t- tend to be these very nice people who are all kind of preoccupied with pleasing others and doing the right thing. And so when we get an emotion that is a kind of forbidden emotion, anger would be the most common, but it could be any positive or negative emotion that we think we're not supposed to have like get into a conflict with people, we, we sweep it under the rug, mm-hmm. don't right. notice right. that we're upset with somebody, and then it comes out indirectly as uh, suddenly you're worrying or you're having a panic attack. Um, and the treatment, according to the hidden emotion model, is to bring that suppressed or repressed or hidden conflict to conscious awareness, help the patient figure out what it is they're denying. And it's generally something in their current life. It's not something from the past. It's buried in the present. It's not buried in the past. It's something like, I hate my job, but I think I'm supposed to love my job, or I want to major in something different in school, but daddy and mommy want me to you know, be a lawyer or an engineer or, or, or whatever. And, and so you're doing this thing you think you should do, but, but not what you really, really want to be doing. And so you help person bring that to conscious awareness that's the detective work and then they have to express that feeling or deal with that problem and when they express the feeling they've been denying or solve the problem they've been avoiding you you see usually a dramatic improvement in the anxiety more often than not a sudden complete elimination of of, of the anxiety now i wonder if you could say a little bit more about this because uh, so let's say about no I, i do hate my job but um this is not acceptable uh, what what I'm anxious about, um, what what's the anxiety directed toward? Well, I can give you an example of that. The first patient that turned me on to this uh, was, was a woman who w- was going to work and having panic attacks at work, and then she, she'd feel like every time her boss walked past her desk that she, she would have the, get nauseous and have the uncontrollable urge to, 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 to vomit on him. And uh, and then so then she'd have to go into the women's room and, and lie down, and then she'd eventually ha- have to go go home. And it sounded for all the world like you know she didn't like like her job. It was was too too nice to admit that, but she kept insisting that she had the most wonderful boss in the world, the most wonderful job in the world. She had taken this job uh, as a, whole, a soda pop, help, helping a fail, fellow with right. a soda pop wholesale business and and she was his right hand woman and uh, he, she said he gives me raises all the time he he compliments me it's the the, the business is growing and, but i but i but i get uh, you know sick i get panic attacks at work and have have to go home so it sounds like her uh, her anxiety did not have a an identifiable uh, um, object right 
Well, the identifiable object was her boss. Every time her boss would come, but past she said her, that she she liked her boss, so she she didn't. Tell that's what made it very very, yeah, very right. puzzling. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and and she, you know, so I used cognitive techniques and exposure techniques, and and I, I really did high powered work with yeah. her, and she was very cooperative and worked hard, did her homework. She got about fifty percent better. But I couldn't get her all the way better. And I, yeah. I used to see this with a lot of my anxious patients. They'd get like 50% improved and then they'd get, get stuck. Yeah. The cognitive work, the, the exposure work to a certain extent, but I couldn't get them cured. And then one day she, she, she came in and about the seventh or eighth session and says, you know, Dr. Burns, I wonder if your cognitive distortions like all or nothing thinking could apply to, to family families. And I said, I suppose so. I've never thought about it. What, what do you mean? And she said, well, you know, in our family, uh, like I was the good daughter and my sister was the bad daughter. And so I always had to get straight A's and I always had to be the class president. And in the summer, I would have to work as a waitress to earn money for college, even in high school. And then my sister, she got to go to parties and be kind of wild and act out and, and do crazy and fun things. But it's it's a distortion because my sister wasn't a bad daughter. She she also got high grades and she's married and she has a family. And she's a wonderful, loving person. And I'm not always as good as people th think I am. I said, well, well what, what do you mean? And, and she says, well, to, to tell you the truth, ever, ever since I've been a little girl, I've had the dream of when I became an adult, I would work designing women's clothing. And I, I, I've painted women's clothing since I've been little. I, I have a tremendous feel for fabrics. Mm -hmm. And this is my dream for my life. And now I'm married. I'm out of college. I was, you know, first in my class in college. I was president of my class in college. And I'm, you know, working as a soda pop wholesaler. And this isn't what I want to be doing w w with my life. I, I, you know, like, when am I going to li live my dream? And that was the hidden emotion, you see. And, and she was saying, oh, I couldn't tell my boss that. He's been so nice to me. And, I, I, you know, I should appreciate what, 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 what he's doing for me. And that's that hidden emotion model. That's the first time I, I became aware of it. So what was the emotion that she was not allowed to feel? The fact that she wanted to leave her, her work and pursue her own dream for, for her life. So it's a hidden purpose rather than an emotion? Yeah, uh, well, it was a hidden urge that she had, a desire in this mm -hmm. in this case. Sometimes the hidden emotion is anger, but in this case it was like wanting to tell her boss, you know, this isn't the job mm -hmm. for me. But she couldn't because she was so nice. You see, I'm not allowed to do something that would hurt somebody's feelings. That's, yeah. that's the dynamic. And so we talked it over. I said, why don't you talk to your husband, talk to your boss, and, you know, uh, come back next week and see what the score is. And she came back the next week, it was like the eighth session, and, and she said it was going to be her, her last session because she'd been cured. And she said she talked to her boss and her husband. They were. She t told her boss, listen, you're the best boss in the world, and I, I just admire you tremendously, but I'm, I, I want to pursue my dream for my my life, and this isn't what it is, and I'll, I'll give you eight weeks' notice, uh, and, and I won't leave until... You found somebody new, and I've completely trained them. And, you know, if it's six weeks, then I'll leave in six weeks. If it takes eight weeks, you know, but because I'm going to support you, because I, I really have always appreciated what, what you've done for me. Yeah. Uh, but he was fi fine with that, and, and uh, so she, she decided to uh, terminate, uh, terminate therapy, and it was like a miracle cure. And uh, then I heard from her six months later, I got a, you know, a letter, th thank you for the help, it was fantastic. She'd uh, taken a couple months off, uh, you know, and did what she never could in high school and mm -hmm. college, you know, just, she just put on her bikini and got in the backyard and got a suntan and did all the things that, you know, she thought the other kids were, got to do in summer vacations and she would go to the beach and have some fun and then she found a woman and uh, who does manufactured women's uh, sportswear and became an apprentice and got involved in the design and manufacture of women's uh, clothing and she said she was just just on top of the world and initially i thought that model just applied to you know that the rare patient but eventually i discovered that this was going on with a good 80 percent of my patients but to bring this to closure we've got these four 
models of treatment of anxiety, and they each have a radically different theory and totally different treatment techniques. And, and then I often say to workshop audiences, which, which is the correct one? And the yeah, answer, how do you pick it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and the answer is they're all totally correct. And they're all uh, effective. And if you want to be an effective therapist, or if as a patient you want to get a complete, a complete cure for, for your anxiety, you've got to work with all, all, all four of these models. And, and the reason that's maybe not a totally trivial point is because when patients go to a therapist, often the therapist is in some school of therapy. So they get one thing. Yeah. Like they'll get some psychoanalytic thing or some cognitive therapy thing or some exposure uh, therapy thing, but I, I integrate all four of those models, and we'll talk about how they all work with practical examples in the next series of, of podcasts. Uh, but so, about if, the integration, you know, what, would you like try one after the other, or how, how would you do that? Um, yes, essentially, I may be working with a thought in a recovery circle, like the patient has a, a, an OCD patient. If I don't wash my hands, I'm going to. Uh, you know, get contaminated and die, or my children will die, or a panic attack patient may have a thought during a panic attack, you know, I'm about to die, or I'm about to go crazy. And I put that in the middle of what I call a recovery circle that has arrows pointing out, out, out of that, and each arrow is a different technique. And on that recovery circle, I'll have 10 or 12 cognitive techniques, like externalization of voices, the experimental technique, identify the distortions, the paradoxical double standard technique, the downward arrow technique, you know, thing, things like that. I'll also have two or three exposure techniques, cognitive exposure techniques, uh, uh, interpersonal exposure, mm -hmm. and classical exposure. I'll also have the hidden emotion technique, and I'll also have some uh, paradoxical agenda setting techniques, in other words, motivational techniques. Yeah. And, and I'll integrate all of those and, until I get a complete elimination of, of the symptoms. Right. And, I, and okay. I won't limit it to one, one, or the other, right. one or the other models. And in the next podcast, we'll show exactly how, how to do that. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to the next one then. And uh, that concludes today's podcast. Thank you, David. Thank you, Fabrice. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com where you will find the show notes for this podcast under the blog page and where you can leave your comments and questions. The website has an abundance of resources for therapists as well as non-therapists, including books, workshops, a list of online training groups around the world, and much more. Theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donzel. I am your host, Fabrice Nye, and I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.